Hello everyone and welcome back to my Beyond History series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode we begin by testing a new landing system for the moon instead of the tiny little landers that we've used so far. I've got a Gemini cabin here. There's actually the the white colored Kerbal Rescue Gemini cabin from the FASA pack and we're going to use this to try and land on the moon. We only have one crew member right now, Joan Kerman, and that's because we might want to pick one of the existing crew members off of the lunar surface uh, sort of do a crew rotation thing we'll see but I decided to test it with just Joan here and we've got sort of a Saturn ish looking rocket it's got two F1s and it's one J2 on the second stage It's the Fiji 21 that you have seen before and if you recall this particular rocket switches off one of the F1 engines in order to limit the thrust to weight ratio because otherwise it would go too far above uh, thrust to weight ratio 4 to be Kerbal rated. So anyway, uh, let's watch it launch and we're going to run the launch script here. Don't ask about the launch escape system. Um, we, we will assume it's ejection seats like it was for Gemini, okay? Uh, just, just, that's how it is. And off it goes. As you can see, it starts out with a vessel mass of about a thousand tons. A little bit over a thousand tons. Pretty good, considering it's supposed to land on the moon. But, of course, it doesn't have enough fuel to return to Earth uh, directly. If we take a look at the Delta V stats, we see um, we've basically got enough to get to the moon here, and then that's to make orbit, and then it can land. Actually, that's to finish transfer and to make orbit. And then uh, this is enough to land and uh, launch again from the surface of the moon. And then that's it. Then it rendezvous with the station and refuels and continues to be a lunar lander. The efficiency is thanks to the fact that the Gemini cabins were really lightweight. And so it's not that much worse than the lightweight lunar landers that we've already seen. Okay, getting ch close to a... Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, G-force of four Gs and it shut off one engine, so it's now just running on the bottom engine here, you can see. Alright, getting ready for the end of the first stage here. And shut down, separation, and ignition of the J-2. Alright. Everything's good. We will at some point have to remove this nose cap because we don't want the docking port blocked. For now it's fine. Food-wise, uh, we've got 14 days on board for one crew member, 7 days for two. So whenever it launches to the moon, it'll only carry one. Uh, and of course after that it'll be relegated to between lunar surface and lunar orbit. And in that case, uh, seven days is fine. The reason why I decided to have a crew member is because the Gemini cabins, for some reason or another, don't like it when you just have it on remote control. It doesn't matter whether you have enough avionics or not. Um, if you have that particular cabin on it, uh, at least for me in this version, it does not let you control it unless there's a Kerbal on board. So, we had to have Joan here. All right, we have made orbit. The program has ended. We do have a limited amount of time before we have to get rid of this stage because our electric charge is running out and we do need to free up those solar panels. Um, yeah, so we need to transfer. Fortunately, we do have 3,411 meters per second left in this stage, which is plenty enough to transfer to the moon. So let's get working on that. Okay, we have our plot and we're ready to go. Let's check the engine, very stable, and ignition. Okay, we are off. We basically waited about 23 minutes in orbit before executing this node, and that took about half of our electric charge, so that's a bit of a problem. We may need some extra electric charge. We should have at least enough to wait a full orbit, and probably more than that. Okay, getting ready for shutdown. down. 
Okay, that's good enough for the J2 stage. I mean, you can't really shut down any more precisely than that. I guess we could use the RCS to refine our approach rather than use the next stage. Okay, separation. And now you can see that the engine to capture around the moon for this is an RD-58. And so there's our tank for that. Ooh, it's short of liquid oxygen though. Potentially from boil off, I guess. That's a bit of a problem. Well, we have numerous ways of dealing with that problem. Uh, one being docking with the station and refueling if we have to use this fuel. But anyway, let's take a closer look at this. We've got copious solar panels. I've uh, kept with the rescue motif, that's why it's sort of white and red, just like the pod is. Except the pod is more of an orangish red, but I, don't, I didn't have that particular color. Yeah, I really should have thought of boil off. We should just slap some extra radiators on this. But that's uh, quite a lot of boil off considering we've only been in orbit for 23 minutes. I guess I must have made this like a default tank or in any case uh, inappropriate tank for this purpose. That is a shame. But anyway you can see our lander. It's a good design. Very simple. Alright well let's see what happens. I could easily uh, mess with it and just uh, time warp to the moon without focusing on the vessel in which case boil off will not occur but let's just do it legitimately and see what happens. We've got, like I said, various things that we can do in order to solve this problem. But yeah, the boy, look at the oxygen go. Well, that's my mistake. So, we will attempt a rendezvous with the station instead of uh, going straight into landing. And first, let's make sure that we deorbit this stage that turned out not to be so useful. It would have been deorbited anyway. Okay, so that will be disposed of. Now, let's try and save this. Okay, and ignition. Now this is an S5.92 engine. And it is a frigate engine, Russian engine, burning UDMH and N204 with a specific impulse of 327 seconds. Downside, only 50 ignitions. I say only 50 ignitions because most of our lander engines are infinite ignition. Now one thing I would like to try and do is replace the engines. Um, I think with KIS and KAS we can do that. We could. This is a light enough engine that a Kerbal should be able to carry it and then just take one of these off and put a new one on. But I'm not sure. It would be something I would like to try though. I don't know if the tech tree currently has an engine of the optimal sort. The optimal sort would either be a methane oxygen or hydrolox engine that could be infinitely restarted or at least restarted enough so that we wouldn't have to replace it so often. And maybe throttleable. I don't know if we actually have something like that in the tech tree right now. The docking system at the top is a propellant only docking port for size reasons. So technically a Kerbal would have to EVA to get in and out of this. Checking on our schedule we do have a maneuver to take care of in 14 days. So I don't know if we're going to be able to line this up with our base in that kind of time. We'll see, but we might have to jump to that before uh, lining this at our base. Okay, we are lined up to dock and proceeding. In this case, we are just attempting to refuel, so the propellant only docking port is no problem. We just need to refuel and then uh, get on with the mission, landing at the base. Of course, we'll spend time up here. Uh, the electric charge thing is quite a problem. Obviously I do not have enough electric charge in this pod for the nighttime side of things. Might have been enough for like daytime 
Uh, we need more battery. Okay, we have connection, RCS off. And uh, yeah, let's uh, fuel her up, but we will be waiting until we are in line with the base. Ah, well, it seems like I have made somewhat of a mistake. Uh, you see, this engine, the frigate engine, uses UDMH in N204. Everything else on the station, including the station's own fuel storage, is Aerozine 50 and N204. See, Aerozine 50, Aerozine 50, Aerozine 50, uh, lots of Aerozine, much more Aerozine, and, and so forth. So there is no UDMH on the station right now, except that brought by the Lunapod, which is what it is called as the Lunapod. But yeah, so that's a bit of a problem. Otherwise, actually, um, this Lunapod, uh, its main tank here, uh, if you can see, 2,526, 2,564, and uh, not much else. Let's call it 3,000 if you'd like. Could easily be refueled by the spare fuel in one of these transfer vehicles that dock to the station. So we have a lot of fuel here, actually. Uh, what we don't have is um, is UDMH. So we'll have to hold off on that particular mission. We might want to bring some people back. Let's let's get something done here. We've got five crew on the station right now, and it looks like Joan's gonna have to stay here for a while. But we've got two of the Orpheus vessels waiting to return home. Maybe we should just do that right now. So uh, let's pack some uh, Kerbals in and get them back. And make sure that we have the fuel to get back. You can definitely see here the sheer size difference between a Gemini capsule and an Apollo command module. And the fact that you can stuff two people in the Gemini cabin is pretty darn special. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously quite cramped. But uh, they did. They did do that. And it sure saves a lot of mass. Alright, transfers are complete. So now we're going to try and bring Wilnerd, Valentina, and Bob back. Let us undock. Let's check our supplies. Well, we're, we're full up. We've got 31 days. So it's a little bit of a waste, but we've got three crew here, so best to be safe. Uh, even though we're probably going to be dumping most of that into the ocean, or just have it burn up in the atmosphere, really. After this, I think we're going to go on to taking care of these missions, and we'll remind ourselves about them. Uh, that's a Mars Sample Return mission, so it's that and that. Jupiter Orbiter 2, well, that's pretty obvious. And Pluto Ambassador, we know. MapSat 1 will be trying to map one of Jupiter's moons. So, we will see where they're at and how they're going. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's settle the fuel down. And now they're carting the moon. In addition to this, I also uh, sneakily uh, deorbited one of the supply vessels. I moved everything that it could uh, continue to supply to another one. So we've cleared up some space. Now that burn does not actually get us into Earth's atmosphere, unfortunately, because of our inclination. We're still above Earth's atmosphere and we only have 260 meters per second left to correct that. So we'll see how that works. Okay, that should be fine. Let's bring it a little bit higher. Let's just say 50. I think that should be fine, right? Hopefully. Hopefully we won't skip again, as we always do. Alright, it's time to dump the service module, so let's just go normal. Going to unlock the fuels up here. Everything seems to be okay. All right. Separation. Okay, let's try that again. Separation. Okay, just the pod now. Okay, so we want the scent mode, obviously. And we will roll and do everything to make sure this is entering properly. Alright, we have flame effects. It's 76 kilometers in altitude. Oh, we're already going up again. Shoot. 
We've lost about half the velocity we need to lose, but this isn't very good. No, this is uh, worse than before. I guess I forgot the correct altitude. Well, I never hit the correct altitude for this thing. I'm never gutsy enough to bring it down really sharply. Okay, here we go again, down into the dark South Pacific. There's New Zealand, actually. Not exactly the most accessible place on the globe to pick up a capsule from. And yeah, we will be coming down this time, thankfully. Okay, here we are for the final bit of re-entry. We popped up for a little bit uh, to 80 kilometers, and then we're coming back down here to burn off the rest of the speed. Okay, time to prepare forward shield separation. And arm parachute. Descent mode off. Smart ASS can be off as well. Okay, full parachute deployment. 9.1 meter, 9 meters per second as it has been, even though that's a little bit harsh. Not entirely clear. I mean, it's almost certainly water, but it doesn't look like it. Yeah, apparently water, but really murky water. Alright, um, well, we've got them back, which leaves uh, two crew on Moon Base 1, uh, two crew on Moon Port 1, and two crew on Space Port 2. So, six altogether deployed. Now that we've brought these three back. Okay, Valentina got uh, extra level, one experience point gained. Wilnerd and Bob did not gain any experience, so that's interesting. I think it's because Valentina went to the surface and hadn't returned since her, her landing on the surface of the moon. So that's why she got the extra point. Alright, so uh, let's take care of some of our interplanetary missions. Okay, here we are with Mars Sample Return two, but we've got a lot of Mars sample return twos. Um, we need to lift its periapsis a bit because it's coming in somewhat steeply here. Uh, so, radial positive, I believe. We don't have a whole lot of fuel to work with here. We do want to come in for a direct landing, but if we have to go around once, that's fine as long as we capture. Capture is important. So I'm gonna go for 48 kilometers, I think. Oh, well, this doesn't have enough uh, juice to get back home anyway. Yeah, something went wrong with this mission. It doesn't have enough return fuel. It does have enough to land, so it is just going to be a lander without ability to return. But we'll test that portion. Sounds like a good thing to test. If there's something wrong with the parachutes, that will be important to note for the other ones. We can adjust them. We toggle info here. We can, if it turns out that this pre-deployment altitude and deployment altitude are wrong, then that'll be better. Uh, we can fix those for the next two missions. So that'll be part of the plan. Now, how long do we have until we reach periapsis? Because we've got other missions to deal with too. One day and 18 hours. Okay, looks like we will reach in time. Okay, approaching Mars here. We are all charged up. I did arm the parachutes. And we can take this solar panel in. Those antennae don't have to be worried about because they're the Sputnik antennae and they are impervious, I think. Okay, so this is lighter than it normally would have been. We would have had much more fuel available for ascent, especially in this container here and these. Right now we do not have that fuel. But in general, this is what's going to happen with uh, something about this size coming in at a periapsis of about 48 kilometers with this velocity at Mars. So that was fairly gentle, but too deep into the atmosphere to just capture. We will now test the whole parachute system 
And again, we are set to 8 kilometer pre deployment and 2.5 kilometer deployment. We're not using pressure because the pressure around Mars is too small to tune it properly. Okay, they deployed, which is good. Uh, if they did not like this altitude, they just rip off. Okay, full deployment brings us to 35 meters per second. And so now I have to use our thrusters to slow down too. Let me get uh, surface info. Okay, we don't have that much fuel. Okay, ah, oh, well, see, now we can't have that happen on the real thing. Ah, uh, I might say real thing, one where this ends up uh, ascending again. But we had plenty of fuel to be a little bit softer with the landing. I was just, yeah, not so good. Anyway, can we get some extra science here? Well, 25 science just for transmitting from the major craters, though for recovery we get 100 science. No comms vessel. No comms devices on this vessel. Hmm. Status clamped. I don't know what clamped means. And why... See, now this is complicated. Uh, I thought we had fixed this. Okay, AIES Comtech should not have a problem, right? It should have the stock transmitter by default as well. And how about the Sputnik antennae? We've got four comms devices here. And electric charge all over the place. Um, it shouldn't know about line of sight, so that shouldn't be an issue. But, let me, I don't know, let's try it again. Nope, cannot transmit data. Well, let me take a look at the configurations for this dish and those antennae, and I'll see if I can fix that. Okay, well, I think I covered this antenna. I made sure it could transmit using the stock transmitter. Uh, the realism overhaul configuration for this antenna deleted the stock transmitter, so that was the problem. But I didn't find the Sputnik antennae, so that's annoying. Let's see if we can transmit now, or whether it is still a problem. Transmit. Okay, now we can transmit. So let's solve that one. So if you're going to try and fix it, you just need to go into the Realism Overhaul configuration for the AIES antennae, and delete the bit where it, it deletes module, antenna, module transmitter for remote tech. Technically, that deletion should only happen when remote tech is present, but it seems to happen anyway. So, but anyway, we, we did our science and there's no point using the second goo container because it's the same thing. So let's get back to, well, let's get on to this Jupiter Orbiter 2 mission and see what we need to do with that. But uh, we, we got some interesting information here. I'll need to use more fuel to land and we do seem to have some extra fuel to use. Um, well, I mean, that's complicated because some of the fuel is up here and meant for ascent from the Mars surface. But hopefully our future missions have a lot more fuel margin. Okay, well, in another case of false advertising, this mission is called Jupiter Orbiter 2. But it is actually aimed at Uranus instead. So let's rename it. And we've got a lot of stuff aimed at Uranus right now. So we've got to manage those and maybe send some off to somewhere else. Okay, come on, let me get this. Actually, this probe core might be easier. Um, rename vessel. This one is Uranus Flyby 1. Okay, so we have to do this correction maneuver to make sure we actually hit our target. And uh, preferably, we would like to hit our target so that we fulfill the Uranus flyby contract, thereby freeing up the Uranus ambassador missions, these two, 
to uh, do something else, like fly by Neptune instead, and fulfill that contract. Pluto Ambassador is definitely aimed at Pluto. We, that, that's not even coming close to Uranus, I don't think. So, yeah. Okay, let's handle this maneuver, and we'll focus view on Uranus to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Right now, we don't even have a Uranus encounter. So this uh, maneuver is meant to get us that encounter. Okay, we've got too little fuel in this stage. I think we have fuel in the probe stage that is currently locked, but I would like to finish this up with this stage properly. Fortunately, we do have a reaction wheel here, so we don't need to use that for turning. Don't need to use the RCS for turning. Ah, uh, does not look like we can use this fuel. All right, let's separate off this stage. And we will unlock this fuel to make our final maneuvers. Now, without RSS expanded, we don't have any moons around Uranus, which is a little bit depressing. But we can make a nice approach like that. And how much would it take to capture? We seem to have 700 available. That's not much. But if we're close enough to Uranus, let me do this. 12 years, geez. Um, that maneuver takes how much? Well, basically 700. <laughs> okay. All right, it'll be it'll be tight. Okay, uh, RCS off. All right, close enough. So we will have that going for us, and let's pay attention to this when we enter Uranus SOI, which is going to be in a while, twelve years. So we're not going to see this probe for a very long time. It's actually getting there like later than everything else. The ambassadors might get there earlier because they're getting more boosts. But it would still be able to beat out this Uranus flyby contract. So now it's actually not the first one, but maybe the last chance kind of situation. But it's a good last chance. All right. So now on to... Um, MapSat 1. Okay, here we are with MapSat 1, and it is going to be aimed at Callisto, so we're going to try and get into orbit around Callisto. That should be UDMH Depot, I misspelled it, darn it. Anyway, let's hide that for now. That's coming up. That'll be our next launch, and that'll be adding a depot to the lunar station to refuel our UDMH and N204 vessels. But uh, here, let's get this going. And so we're going to put it into a close pass at Jupiter and then capture at Jupiter and do the three-step version of getting to Callisto orbit, actually four-step. So first we are going to capture at a low Jupiter orbit on one side, uh, high on the other, and then we're going to boost up our orbit to Callisto's orbit at the apoapsis and then we're going to have to adjust our inclination here because there's no way of doing that on the way in, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's just uh, a little bit of residual um, inclination issue there. And uh, then we can capture around Callisto and we should have enough fuel for that. So that is our approach to Jupiter, 59,000 kilometers. Um, we could probably bring it in lower than that if we wanted to. We'll make that decision as we enter Jupiter SOI. I think uh, we might have a chance to adjust things as far as the inclination as well. So let's add that alarm and that will be another year. So on to launching that UDMH depot. So we are attempting to use this launcher to toss 21 tons to the moon, not lunar orbit, just uh, translunar injection. So that's basically half of what uh, Saturn V could do, but we're only using two F1s and one J2.
Granted, it's J2S, but the F1s are regular F1s because we couldn't use F1As that would uh, cause too much thrust to weight ratio, even with shutting down one engine. So let's just run PG21. All right, it's launched, but it's wiggling a little bit back and forth. Perhaps strutting the payload would have been helpful, I think. I'm going to limit the gimbal on these. Pretty sure we don't need the full gimbal range of the F1 engine right now. But of course, we might need it once we shut down one engine. So we've got a lot of stuff built, actually. You can see these these launches are all already constructed. Quite a lot. Some of them are obsolete, of course. The Mars-class vessel might not be. We just haven't decided to use it yet. Spaceport resupply missions, moonport resupply missions. We've got three moonport resupply missions because I just keep building while we're doing other stuff. So, uh, and our build rate is quite high. We've got the Nerva Tug already constructed. We've got a uh, Jupiter low orbit mission to fulfill a contract already constructed, and that will be using the Nerva Tug. So, we've already got a mission for the Nerva Tug. We've got the ISRU for the moon. We've got another Luna Pod, just like the. Gemini base Luna pod that we've got docked to the space station right now around the moon. And so there, there are a lot of things and another Orpheus mission. But they're all waiting for the right time and we've got a long list of things to do including this particular mission. Okay, we are on one engine. Uh, let's give it the full gimbal range now. Of course, this mission was not intended. I just, uh, it was a mistake on my part to not have UDMH, not UDNH, supplies at the lunar station. And we are also building a similar depot for our Earth orbit station, because that's bound to be useful. But that will launch on a Fiji 11, somewhat smaller than this. Okay, and we have J2 ignition. I think because of the previous mission, we don't have a fairing separation in the script right now, because with the Luna pod, there was no fairing. So I'll just manually separate the fairings now. Okay, and that is our new, new fuel depot that will dock to the station. We also are using it as sort of a docking adapter module, so that other missions can dock to the station more readily. Okay, we are about to make orbit. Uh, it does not seem like this stage is going to have quite enough to transfer the payload to the moon, so it doesn't have a 21 ton to the moon payload capacity, but that's all right. This is a fuel depot with two engines. It can propel itself quite a ways anyway. So, uh, yep. A little bit ambitious. The launcher was only 1,200 tons compared to 3,000 for Saturn V, so it was basically 40% of Saturn V, uh, and trying to send about half the payload to the moon. A bit overly ambitious, and of course, much less cost because we were only using one J2 compared to a total of six for a Saturn V. All right, let me plot for the moon. Well, from the look of it, we're at a particularly magical time to transfer to the lunar station because our inclination difference is only three degrees. Normally we get like between 10 and 20 and sometimes even more than 20, but uh, mark this on the calendar. What date is it? Uh, I guess every 29 days or so we'll get this. June 26th. Okay. Well, uh, I'll have to try and make up a calendar for when we should be. I, I guess it's every 29 days. I mean... I'm not entirely sure, and that's the math is as simple as that. I always worry when the math seems, you know, like it's in, in the same place uh, in lunar orbit every time, but maybe, maybe that's the case. All right, but we have to wait uh, orbit to do this burn, so let's extend some panels. Okay, here we go. We have to actually bring up the J2 dialogue because 
when it's unstable it doesn't actually show a red marker on the icon unlike other engines been caught by surprise by that before anyway here we go a little bit late on the burn whoa 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 uh, maybe not so much it's because we're sort of sitting on this docking port that the payload wiggles so much I should have put some extra struts there okay and separation and on we go this little tank as you can see has 6700 meters per second still within the burn time limits of the S5.92's the nice thing about this is uh, since this eventually will not need those anymore we could actually theoretically take those off with a Kerbal and um, move them on to the lander which uses the same kind of engine right right now we have two pilots at our lunar station so I don't think they can do a test of whether they can grab these engines we also probably need a KIS container somewhere I forget if we have one there right now we've already added science modules to both of our stations we should add KIS modules now okay we are preparing to make orbit here and I'm using surface negative velocity because I want to I haven't plotted out the correction and inclination and I'll just do a bit of a yaw in order to make that happen so we do need to be flat to the horizon there to make that work okay well um, maybe I should continue and try for a somewhat lower orbit Nope, that was even worse. 25 kilometers now, but we'll just work with it. We can probably do something over at Apoapsis. Okay, that's good. Uh, we just corrected our inclination at uh, ascending node and or descending node. And we've got a closest approach distance of 243 meters. That's pretty darn good from this distance. but we have to watch out we've got a lot of relative velocity still because we're in this higher orbit and we could easily miss if we don't burn at the right time well looking at this we're not going to be placing this at the best location to dock new missions because it's too close to the previous little hub It'd be better to put it on the end currently occupied by the Orpheus spacecraft, the only one docked to the station right now. So, what I'm saying is maybe we will move things around in the future, but for now, let's just get it on to the station so it can do its work and refuel the Lunapod. I suppose for now, having this at a diagonal might not be a bad idea just to stagger it from that hub's docking ports. Okay, we have connection. It's actually pretty small, but it's just a fuel container after all. And we should be able to top this off now. So next time we'll try and land this lander at our surface base and I, it's probably out of position again so you might have to wait a little while but we have 17 days until the next Mars sample return mission hopefully this one full of fuel instead of uh, mostly empty uh, is prepared to arrive at Mars I think that's a Mars arrival and not just another maneuver node and then we have to fix up our Pluto ambassador trajectory and then another Mars sample return it's a little bit odd that there's 17 days well arrival at Mars can be pretty far apart it's departure that generally occurs all at the same time Mars base 1 our first surface base at Mars which is basically just this little tiny container similar to our lunar base 
will be arriving in 89 days. And then we'll finally have our Earth to Jupiter launch window, which will be where we use the Nerva for the first time, hopefully, if all goes well. Okay, so that is the plan going forward. I think I'm going to forego filling up, well, actually having a lower center of mass might be good. Um, yeah, I'll fill it with that tank, because as it is, this little lander probably has too much fuel for the mission and too little thrust to weight ratio, so I'd rather not fill it up all the way. Anyway, while this is going on, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.